a very good morning morning sir a very good morning to one and all today is a international day for preservation uh, conservation of tigers it is called as international tiger day and the importance is well known to all of us that tiger is a, one of the most important animals in the biodiversity if you take it and why we need to conserve tigers that is also very very important we know that uh, in 20000 in the 20th century we had around more than 1 lakh tigers in the world as per the estimation during 2010 it has dwindled or it has been reduced to just 3000 plus tigers so during 2010 during the uh, when there was a meeting held to conserve tigers it was decided to celebrate international tiger day to create awareness among the community on the importance of tiger and in the biodiversity and to why it is so important as to be discussed among the community the kerala state council for science technology and environment and the envis hub which is supported by the ministry of environment and forest government of india is celebrating this uh, international tiger day with a lecture from dr anil kumar bardwaj who is a senior fellow in the wildlife institute of india see anil kumar bardwaj has obtained his botany uh, pg degree from uh, punjab university punjabi university patiala in 1982 then he was actually an i is an is officer ifs officer he served the kerala forest department for many years and uh, he was also a, uh, associated with wwi for 15 years before uh, in between also and he was actually looking after the tiger management activities in kerala for a long time he was a director of uh, peria tiger reserve which is one of the most important tiger reserve in the country moreover actually uh he was a particip- uh, was involved in many eco development activities during the period in that area he is a right man to speak to us during the day because he will be giving us how to conserve why it is so important why community livelihoods ever and these are important i request uh, sri anil bharat sir to take over the session and give us a lecture i welcome sri anil bharat sir the participants who are here and all others uh, my fellow colleagues from the science and technology council and others to this uh, webinar so anil kumar bardha sir please continue thank you sir Anil Kumar Bhatia sir, your mic is not on. Thanks to you, and a uh, lot of thanks to uh, Council and uh, the Envis Ministry of Environment and Forest that I am getting this opportunity to talk to my own people in Kerala. COVID has uh, really restricted the the movements. and i have not been able to come to kerala for the last many many months now very eager to come back to kerala uh, my uh, congratulations on this uh, international tiger day to everybody all the participants and uh, let me begin with the, you know one small thing which uh, i want to share before this uh, uh, presentation begins i remember in 2006 Uh, we had uh, a training class in uh, peria and uh, one of the uh, resource persons who was invited in this was a very old person he came there 
and uh, I mean, he shared his experiences of, uh, you know, uh, of the time when he was in Peria. And uh, he ensured that uh, before he leaves uh, after this program, he goes to so many uh, tribal uh, families in the nearby, you know, Manakuli and Paliakuli. And uh, he also had brought a lot of, uh, you know, gifts with him to be given to all those, uh, you know, families. And this gentleman was uh, none other than Mr. Narunayar, who was, uh, you know, probably the, the first officer uh, in Peria who could venture inside the tiger reserve in the core area and deep inside the forest and explore Peria. Not only that, he was a field, field man, but uh, he also, um, you know, had a very, very, you know, good relation with the local people there. And yesterday, we, we lost uh, Mr. Nanunaya. He expired yesterday. So I just wish to convey my, you know, prayers for Mr. Nanunaya that his soul may rest in peace. And I thought, I must mention, you know, this uh, gentleman who had been uh, a very important person for Peria during those times. Uh, to begin with this, uh, now my presentation, uh, let me also uh, say that, uh, you know, when uh, I was asked that on what topic I should uh, be comfortable to speak, so I, I told, I think, the communities and the livelihood, that, that was, you know, my focus always. And... Uh, in fact, in the last 30 years, right from 1991 onwards, I have been lucky to, you know, continue to work in this area of uh, conservation of tigers. And uh, as already uh, mentioned, um, that, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity of working both inside the state as well as outside in Wildlife Institute of India. So I had some experience of, uh, you know, the, uh, the Kerala and uh, the other states in the country. And I thought I'll share with you all those experiences and uh, maybe it will make some sense to you on this particular occasion. The second thing I just wanted to mention, you know, in the beginning itself was that, uh, you know, we forest officers, uh, we are very bad in uh, documentation. And I'm no exception to that. Peria has been, uh, you know, uh, my, what do you say, very close to my heart because I have learned a lot from Peria and my, uh, you know, gratitude always to all the officers who have worked in Peria, to all the staff who has contributed immensely and, and, and to all the communities, tribal, non-tribal communities who have really contributed for uh, making this area as a as a one of the so-called model in the country. So you'll you'll get a lot of stuff of uh, Peria, but slightly deep uh, deep insights into what is what has happened in Peria, and of course then from Peria we'll move to the other areas. But one thing which you'll realize in this is that most of you know good practices which are coming so far uh, will be from south. And gradually we are exploring the, what are those good practices in, uh, in the other uh, states, Northeast, or we have in the central part of the central Indian uh, landscapes. So we will be talking about that. I also want to mention here that uh, when I said that, you know, we are very poor in documentation and writing, and my daughter was in fact, you know, always behind me that see, such a large experience, uh, which is there, why don't you document it? And uh, with you know her leadership and uh, her lead, she has been able to document the story of Peria. Uh, it was a, a small IUCN initiative of you know bringing out case studies. And uh, I really want to mention her name that she was the force which has uh, ultimately looked deep into the you know the experiment of Peria, and uh, she has tried to you know, document uh, this initiative. Let me begin with the, uh, you know, this slide show. I hope I'll be able to do that.
Dr. Harim Narayan has already, you know, in the beginning itself, uh, mentioned about the the condition of the tigers, uh, not only in India, but also in uh, you know the other uh, other parts adjoining India. Yes, so you rightly said that, you know, the number of tigers were, you know, really high. If you, if you look back, say, 1800s, then about, uh, you know, 80,000 plus tigers were reported during those periods. These were all very big, you know, very broad estimates. And uh, this number uh, reduced to about 10,000 during 90s. And obviously, there was a reckless poaching of tigers during that uh, during those periods, and the number really got reduced. And in uh, 1970, this number actually became very very alarming. It came to 1,827, and uh, it was at this time <clears throat> that the government of India realized that this is a big responsibility which country has to, you know, take steps, and that is how. Uh, in 1973, the Project Tiger was launched. And today we know that 70% of the tiger population of the world is available in India. So that is the, I think, the responsibility and the proud, which we should all ha always have, that major share of population of tiger is in India. The number of tiger, tiger reserves, uh, you know, also increased. In 1973, these were, there were only nine tiger reserves. That was the beginning, only nine areas were selected for the tiger reserves. And as on 2021, as on today, we have 51 tiger reserves. So the number has really increased during this period. There had been ups and downs as far as the, the project tiger is concerned. And uh, I think everybody remembers that two th 2006 was a very important and very, very crisis ridden period in which, uh, you know, the um, Sariska, which was a very important tiger reserve in Rajasthan, Sariska lost its tigers. The tigers disappeared. After that, Panna episode was repeated. So the tiger reserves, they became totally devoid of tigers because of various reasons and obviously poaching was one of the reasons. And uh, it was then uh, a very systematic and scientific assessment was carried out regarding number, population estimation. And it was revealed in 2006 that the number of tigers left in the wild is just 1,411. That was a very alarming figure. Even people were not ready to accept this number. But after that, there were many initiatives which have uh, you know, been undertaken. And uh, because of all those good initiatives of uh, everybody, you know, department, the communities, the, the society at large, the government, the uh, the po tiger population as on today is 2,967. That is the last estimate which was carried out in 2018. This report was published in 2019. Now, uh, tiger, to, to say, we say that tiger is a, you know, flagship species. Tiger is, uh, but we, there, there are also views that see, we only talk about tiger and we forget the rest of the virus. But we have to appreciate that tiger is not, tiger conservation is, or the project tiger is not the conservation of tigers alone. In fact, it is an ecosystem conservation. So when you, when you protect tiger, in fact, you are trying to protect the entire range of, you know, those components of the ecosystem, which this tiger landscapes are having. And we should also appreciate that as on today, Nearly 2.23% of the total area of the country is uh, covered by the tiger reserve. Uh, so that means so we, the concern that I think we had at the Australian side was that if we said, um, you know, India has a population of 1.4 billion and, you know, 500 million. So we have about 2.23% of the total geographical area of the country, which is being protected, being conserved the name of the tiger and uh, tiger conservation therefore 
is acting as a torch bearer for the conservation scenario in the country. Let me come to the next slide. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, the even though I mean the tiger conservation is very, very important, when you look at the realities, we find that the poorest districts of this country, which are you know scheduled five areas, they are also the prime habitats of the tiger. But these are the areas which, which overlap with the poverty. So areas which are very important from tiger point of view, from conservation point of view, they are the poorest parts of the country. Therefore, protection of tiger is, we, we understand that the protection of tiger is uh, possible only if we protect the forest in which this tiger is roaming about. And if you really want to protect the tiger and the forest, then you cannot ignore the people. So that is why we say that the protection of these forests is, is itself inseparable from the fortunes of the people who in India inhabit forest areas. So this was a quote from the Tiger Task Force report 2005. So if you have to really protect tiger, then you have to ensure that the people of this area, they are also not properly, uh, properly treated and they are also, you know, their, their well-being is very, very important if you really want to ensure the conservation and if you really want to ensure the well-being of the tiger. Now look at the scenario of the, uh, you know, conservation. Uh, so during 70s, when the Project Tiger was launched, during that period, the conservation and uh, the, you know, the development, these were seen as two different, different things. So we used to say that, you know, as far as conservation is concerned, let the protected area take care of it, let the project tiger area take care of this, let the forest take care of this. But the, outside these areas, we only talked about the socioeconomic concern. We never, we never thought that there are a large number of people staying inside these very important conservation areas and their development is also very, very important. As on today, now there is a you know, gradual realization that if you have to talk about conservation, you have to also take care of the communities which are staying either inside these tiger reserves or they are staying on the fringes of the tiger. Therefore, there is an overlap between conservation and development and this overlap both in time, space and thinking we call in different ways. We call them as the buffer zone, we call them as the mutual impact zones, we call them as the areas where we have to operate the participatory management, we call them areas where we are implementing the development program. So it is not only in terms of the area, it is also in terms of our activities, it is also in terms of our thinking. And this is how there is a change as far as conservation and development is concerned. Now, the evolution of this thinking of the participatory management is you know, it, it is very old and I can take it back to 1982 when the third World Congress of National Parks and Protected Areas were held in Bali, Indonesia, where it was, you know, recommended, it was felt and recommended that the, the people, they are very, very important. You have to take care of the people if you want to really conserve the tiger and the biodiversity. And as, you know, happens in any such uh, international conference, that we come, come back, the, those who attend the conference, they come back. And uh, after coming back to the country, the task force was constituted by the Indian Board for Wildlife in 82. And it was supposed to recommend how we can go ahead if we have to implement the, the agreements which we had in the, in the conference. And fortunately then the Indian Forest Policy 88, which provided a lot of space for the community participation. 90, uh, uh, 1990, Government of India's resolution on joint forest management. And it was in 1991 that a scheme, special scheme of eco-development around national parks, wildlife sanctuaries and tiger reserves. So this was a you know outcome of so many things happening in the past that a special scheme which was anchored by the Project Tiger Directorate, that was initiated 
in the name of the eco development. In other countries, we call it conservation and development, conservation development projects. But in India, we call the eco development programs. Now, any program when you start implementing, you don't know, you know how how we have to go about it. And uh, here comes the role of the you know the projects because projects give you a, a you know space for experimentation, learning, and then you can roll out the entire program. And I would like to mention at least three very important projects which were implemented. One was the Forestry Research Education Extension Project of 1994, World Bank Federal Project. Another was the UNDP WI project on management and eco development planning, which was purely a capacity building project. And the third project was the India Eco Development Project, which you know Peria was one of the sites for that. The Forestry Research Education Extension project was you know implemented in two sites. One was the Kalakad Mundandare Tiger Reserve, very adjoining to you know Kerala. And uh, another was in the Himalayan region, so Western Ghats and Himalayan region. They took two different uh, areas. So in the Himalayan region, this was the great, uh, great in uh, uh, GHMP, Great Himalayan Asia Park, and in uh, Western Ghats it was the KMTR, Kalakad Mundandurai Tiger Reserve. <laughs> India Eco Development Project actually gave a lot of insights. How do we go about it? Just like the the forestry research and education extension project and wa project UNDP project gave the required capacities to implement such program and later on you know um, there was a you know action plan national wildlife action plan all those things were included in this and the um, 2006 was another very important year when uh, the wildlife protection act was amended to make uh, certain changes which are very critical and uh, uh, I, later I will uh, let you know that how Kerala has played a very important role uh, as far as the amendment of 2006 is concerned. And this is how Kerala has done certain things which has national level and regional level implications. I think that is what we have to understand. When you are in Kerala, when we are all working in Kerala, we don't appreciate and we don't understand what we have been able to do. But when you go out and then you realize the larger scenario, that Kerala has played a very important role in this. And let us, I think, the, the Forest Dwellers Act, that is another very important thing. They are, they are you know, the, the communities, they've come to center stage as far as the, uh, the conservation of the forest is concerned. Now, eco development, which I mentioned, and this is basically an approach for community participation and uh, participatory management of the protected areas in general, of course, the tiger reserves, you know, we uh, form part of that. Now, the reason was very simple that the traditional approach of policing was not yielding the result. A lot of conflicts were happening. And uh, there was a need of uh, alternate approach, which came in the form of the eco development. And uh, certain, you know, very important ingredients of eco development, when we say eco development, site specific, it is a uh, conservation friendly, it's a, uh, you know, through community participation. So these are some of the elements which you know any eco development program must have. So eco development in one area may differ from another area. That's a different issue. You may have different type of things, but the fundamental principles will always remain the same. And ultimately, it is trying to see that how we can involve the communities in conservation through their empowerment. And basically, the aim is to sustain participation to developing an environment that encourages the mutuality of conservation and development. How do we merge these two interests? And empowerment is very, very important. And these signs of empowerment are something which you have to really perceive in these experiments. Do we have those signs of empowerment in our program? If we are not able to, you know, have that empowerment, then such programs are not going to sustain. And of course, it is an interdisciplinary culture. It is no more uh, forestry. It is, it is sociology. It is development. It is everybody's concern now, because you are talking about the conservation in a in a different platform with a different type of objectives. Now, with this, uh, you know, participatory approaches and uh, the eco development, as on today, as on today, we have two very important models. And uh, I mentioned that the Kalakar Mundandurai Tiger Reserve is a very prominent model, older than Periyar, even I will say. 
and uh, the problem in this area was a lot of grazing habitat degradation people were you know taking firewood they were grazing the cattle inside and uh, through these programs they have been able to generate a mass support emotionally charge the communities for the conservation of the tiger reserve and they say that safe kmtr safe tamar bani so that means the river river and water has been you know prime focus of the communities and this is how they have been able to this make this area as a uh, as a model and as on today this figure is slightly uh, you know stale I, I have written 11 crore roof corpus but i think it is about 20 crore corpus of money which is being circulated among the community so they loan we loan get it back and this is how they have multiplied this this corpus and this is being used for you know small small activities for the well-being and for the livelihood of the local communities Periyar, as you already uh, know, because all of you might have visited, we had the problem of uh, ganja cultivation, we had the problem of cinnamon bark collection, heavy dependence of the local communities, mass tourism, pilgrimage, and some of these problems even remain today also. Not that all the problems will be solved, those problems are, but the magnitude which uh, you know we used to face during those times, particularly in terms of the pilgrimage, that magnitude is definitely now much better managed. The pilgrimage is not stopped. The number of pilgrimages, uh, pilgrims also might have, you know, remained st stable or it might have increased. But it is much better managed situation than what it was during that time. And Perrier brings uh, certain very innovative things which have happened, converting the, you know, the ex-poachers into the protectors, the park, to freeing the tribals from the money lenders you know, clutches, uh, linking ecotourism with the protection and community man, uh, community managed pilgrimage. So these were some of the innovative things which happened, which we even we never thought that you know such a, such things are possible. And ultimately, the Perrier Foundation, and uh, foundation which was basically supposed to carry forward this this agenda, which was project based under the India Development Project, and idea was that how do we link the livelihood with conservation and how do we bring in science in the conservation of the tiger and the management of the community. This is how the Peria Foundation. And I think the, I was telling that what is the Kerala has contributed, that the concept of Kerala, the learnings from Peria Foundation have been upgraded at the national level. The Wildlife Protection Act was amended in 2006. And as on today, all the tiger reserves, majority of the tiger reserves, they have the Tiger Conservation Foundation. So the concept was taken from Kerala only. There were some learnings from Madhya Pradesh, but I think the basically the concept comes from Kerala. And this is how all the tiger reserves now have the foundation. We'll talk in the end what, what those foundations are doing. Not only that the tiger reserves, but uh, look at you know the Gulf of Manar Biosphere Reserve, which is a marine and a terrestrial marine ecosystem. We are a new initiative of involving the stakeholders that has been started and the process is still going on. Great Himalayan National Park is another very good example where there is a uh, there is a you know a community empowerment and that is focusing more basically on the women. So the women saving and credit groups and this is a this is a you know clear example where the women through their empowerment who were basically these small small groups have ultimately gone to the you know the panchayats in kerala also it has happened so this is what the political empowerment we, we say that the local people who are conservation cautious who are green institutions at the grassroots level when they start coming in the panchayat level, local self government, then I think this is what we call as the political empowerment. That you have a you have a you know a panchayat which is much more cautious about conservation, much more conscious about how to protect these areas, and this is how uh, you know the uh, great, uh, great Himalayan National Park provides a lot of experience. Paramikulam Tiger Reserve. You know, I I like to share with you that. When I, you know, after serving in uh, area, I went to uh, Wildlife Institute of India. 
came back. Then I worked as the field director in Periyar and went back again to Wala Institute. And then my director always used, used to ask, hey, this can happen only in Periyar. And why it does not happen in the other area? So I think it is very specific. So this was a question which was really, you know, putting a lot of pressure on my mind and on various other, uh, you know, colleagues who were working this. And uh, ultimately, we understood that how the things things have happened in the field. And as on today, what has happened is Parambikulam becomes a, a still more vibrant area. And yesterday I was you know, informed by the uh, the field director of the Parambikulam that they have been, they have received a, a very important award for Parambikulam for their initiatives. So Parambikulam, which is uh, another very important, and in certain respects, I'll say that Parambikulam has even gone gone beyond what we has been achieved in Peria. So Parambikulam becomes another very important model. Irabikulam National Park and Chinar Wildlife Sanctuary. They become other uh, important areas where you could learn that how the community participation could take place. And uh, this is not through foundation, but this is through the forest development agency. So these are the new models which are appearing. And uh, uh, let me also tell you that uh, Periyar and uh, your KMTR, they have been nationally recognized as the you know, centers, center of learnings. And people from uh, the other uh, Tiger Reserve, other protected areas, they have been visiting these, uh, you know, two areas for understanding how these uh, two areas, they could uh, do these good initiatives. And many of these, you know, learnings will be passed on to the other areas of the country. Now, you know, talking about these uh, initiatives and the outcome is very easy. We can say, oh, in uh, Periyar, the, you know, the X wine award collectors, they were converted as the protectors of okay. Or we can say that the tribals, they are now running ecotourism program and they have stopped, you know, all illegal and uh, unsustainable uh, resource use in Peria Tiger. Very easy because you are seeing only the outputs. But what has been the inside story? What has been the process is something which is which will never be known unless you document it. That's the problem we have, that the institutional memories will be always lost. Nobody wants to, you know, uh, understand the inside stories and the processes which have happened. Look at, I mean, I am just trying to show you some of the uh, figures, some of the photographs. See, I mean, uh, on the, sorry. See, these Nukernatics street plays by these youngsters, were a very powerful medium for spreading the message of conservation, for spreading the message of protecting Peria. And they were all local youth, nobody else. Look at the second photograph where Dr. Gigi Thomas, who was our nature education officer at that time, and there was another gentleman, Mr. Sunil, who had with, with him, Sunil is still with the uh, foundation. Their job was basically to talk to the the students, the those who are coming to Peria, Peria for nature education program. So large number of visitors, large number of students, large number of you know schools, school children, they used to come. So very important role because you know see, if you convert your uh, young generation, then I think you have won the battle because there these these young young children who were you know at that time motivated. Today, they have become very big supporters of conservation, not only in Peria, but in Kerala in general. Look at the third photograph where you have these Guru Swamis talking, talking to, you know, people, pilgrims who come to Sabrimala during those the pilgrimage season, and they will be here for one or two days. Who will listen to you? Nobody will listen to you. So the, then the idea was picked up that let us talk to the Guru Swamis who are leading these, these groups. And there were a lot of initiatives with these Guru Swamis. And moment, I mean, they, these uh, religious leaders and heads, they pick up certain messages. The things become much more easy. So these were the innovations which were made. I'm just quoting a few examples. And these were the inside processes which have happened. Then only you see these outputs. Same thing has happened in uh, Tamil Nadu, in KMTR. So KMTR, they have used 
a variety of media for you know really building roads to the people see the cycle rallies they had the these uh, street plays they had variety of reason i remember that uh, when you know in 95 i came to kmtr and i was part of a 600 km human chain so 600 kilo kilometer people were you know in line surrounding the forests of kmtr all villages and catching hands with each other and they said we have a 600 km human chain this is a gesture this is a emotion which you can see and this is how kmtr still carries those emotions the processes do not end by just giving slogan just carrying out cycle rallies just carrying out sports function but you have to also then build trust you have to also execute certain things and there are certain activities which you know will establish your credibility among the villagers among the communities and this was the second step which has happened and range of activities activities so you it, it is all site specific you don't know which activity will suit to which area this could be in the form of the medical camps this could be sometime in the form of a small help for a temple renovation it could be a small help for uh, creating uh, you know the water uh, canals help for water canals it could be small help for uh, you know improving the quality of the streets so variety of things parabikulon for example they have you know purchased the ambulance so these are all you know the what the credibility building activities which have been carried out so this was a very 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 important process when you look at the uh, implementation of the program institution building is a very important see unless you have uh, institution a structure an arrangement in place for implementing these things you cannot carry forward these things for a long department can do only for some time but you for a long term you know maintenance a long term continuation of such program you need institution and institution building is a very very rigorous process so normally what happens i often say that uh, you know moment we start talking to the people the first thing which will happen after some time will be the people will start fighting among themselves because you know there will be some benefits seen and there will be some people who will be interested to grab all those benefits so there will be a stage that after the formation of the institution there will be a storming stage that people will start fighting with each other and normally as a you know um, as a forest forester i will try to disappear oh these people they they want to fight only they don't know they are not understanding what we are doing and we this is the stage where you know we are required and we run away because we cannot handle this if you are able to stay in this stage and help the community to pass through this stage then only they normalize and they start to form so there are stages in the institution building and we have to understand you know at that time when the program started our understanding about institution building was very good now the staff has much better understanding of the institution building and uh, so the institution building is a very important process it takes time it takes energy it requires different skills among the staff and this is what has happened is in, in most of these areas whether these are institutions of the level of the foundation whether these are institutions of the level of government committees or these are of the self help groups or these are of the you know the other uh, nature clubs all these institutions they require a institution building process because without this process any institution is a is a body and institution will become only if the body gets the soul so the process is a soul soul is there there is there is nothing no body is only body so i think the process inculcates the soul into these these bodies and that is how those group of people chairman vice chairman secretary and your members they get converted from a organization into a institution and that is what the you know the complete game now comes the you know the implementation that what should be done how do we implement the program and uh, the, this this learning also has evolved over the time so there could be many things which can be done on form i mean those could be using the, their own resources it could be first of all strengthen the trust 
building confidence among the community. It could be the managing the middlemen. What normally happens in a you know poverty ridden area, yet maximum benefit is taken by middlemen. I'm not telling the middleman is a bad bad guy. Middleman is required. But if the 70% of the you know benefit is going to the middleman, then how the producer, how the you know the beneficiary, what he will get. So I think managing the middleman is another very trick. So middleman has to get a, a reasonable amount, but I think the maximum benefit has to go to the and this is what we have been able to do in Peria. When we, you know, um, um, we saw that the tribals they they cultivate and harvest their own pepper. So this was basically a managing the middleman game. Intensification of agriculture. How poorly we manage the agriculture? Because this is just a half-hearted effort. Because you know, the, let us also understand the tribals, they were not originally the you know the farmers. So the tribals who have been in the forest areas, when they have come out. Agriculture is something which is a new profession for them, and they have not learned it with their heart and soul. And intensification of agriculture, never thought of that. So intensification of agriculture, diversification of agriculture. Pepper, one season there could be a good price, another season there could not be a good price. So you need a diversification of the crops. Marketing, a community is, is not as good in marketing, particularly the tribal community. Value additions, organic farming, certification, these are the new innovations which can be done and which could fetch them better prices. Building institutions, livestock improvement, particularly in West Bengal, you know, a lot of effort has been made on the livestock because there is a, you know, already a, a, a knowledge and a skill of livestock management in those areas. And uh, department has tried to focus on the livestock industry. Sustainable source use management can also be there because you know the biodiversity conservation does not mean that you protect everything. You know, you have to also use biodiversity in a sustainable way. That is what the you know the biodiversity conservation strategies talk about, policies talk about. Non-food uh, uh, wood forest products, medicinal plants, forest honey, warming composting, value addition, marketing. In Kerala, we have this institution of Madhu Lakshmi. I think this is one way, one way of proactive marketing of the produce. And sustainable fishing, some of the areas like Peria, the, the fishing has become sustainable. Similar things have happened in Madhya Pradesh also, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra also. So fishing is another thing, but fishing is something which even sanctuary you can allow. Chibaya Warden can allow fishing, provided it is sustainable. So I think these are some of the innovations which can be done by using the natural resources. There could be certain things which are what we say the ultimate off farm activities, enterprise yeah. development, NTFP products and marketing, handicrafts, trainings, tourism products, small businesses, eateries. This has been very very nicely you know used in KMTR. Soap making, piggeries. This also is an innovation in KM KMTR. Poultry, fish farming. A lot of such experiments have been done in uh, West Bengal. Horticulture, Northeast, there is something, you know, on horticulture and in, in Kerala also it has been tried. Responsible tourism. I think responsible tourism, we have now very good lessons from uh, Peria, KMTR and few other areas. Not many areas where you know, the tourism is really helping, but we are now trying to understand that how, what are the other areas where such good, good practices are happening. I just uh, wanted to show you, not to talk in detail, these uh, innovations of uh, ecotourism, uh, which you might have, you know, experienced, you might have seen in Peria, the nature walk, the tribal heritage, the bullock cart, the jungle in tiger trees, jungle patrol. You know, majority of uh, these experiments are revolving around the tribals. And we have to understand that the history repeats itself. See, these tribals, they were when the you know the forests were free and these were under the old uh, regimes of the kings, the the Punjar uh, kingdom, they were actually very important. They were very important to the Maharaja at that time. They were in fact very close to Maharaja. And Maharaja has given these tribals certain rights and privileges and certain duties inside the forest. So they had their own systems of managing the forest. 
but gradually the the conservation of the forest the protection of the forest was influenced by the colonial uh, policies even though i mean kerala uh, was not under the british directly but there were a lot of influence and this is how the you know the periyar tiger reserve first of all became a you know lake reserve and uh, the periyar dam came into being and then it became a sanctuary a game reserve and a sanctuary and a tiger reserve so all those policies of the western policy based on the model of you know the uh, north north american model yellowstone national park model so gradually the things have become, and the people who were inside the forest they un, all of a sudden became illegal we don't understand this those were those people who had their rights inside or who were you know free dwelling communities in that in, in those forests suddenly they become illegal all those activities become illegal fine these situations are different i mean the if you have to really protect these areas then you require certain things in place and this is how the reversal of the policies start taking place that 1991 onwards we are talking about community policy we are talking about empowerment of these communities and this is how through these uh, programs now we have much more say for these communities for their livelihoods for the decision making and these become important instruments in uh, you know uh, management of area so what i want to say when you say tiger trail or when you say this bamboo rafting it is not merely a product it has lot of history and it has lot of process involved that is how you have got this this bamboo rafting or that is how you have got the the tiger trail in place pilgrimage management is a big challenge i tell you a big challenge not only in kerala but everywhere you know most of the areas have some shrines important shrines you talk about any area for example now i am staying in uh, dehradun garhwal is full of pilgrims so you have the badrinath you have the kedarnath you have uh, you know the hemkund sahib people who used to come previously during season time is a continuous travel it is only because of the covid now the things have you know halted for some time but otherwise these were recklessly visited areas you know recklessly i'll say i'm sorry to use this word because you know it is some unmanageable crowds and uh, how do you manage such crowds and how do you make such crowds sensitive that they at least don't destroy the area to that extent and i think this is the example which we should learn from uh, um so sabrimala that during 90s the way the things were happening in sabrimala and during 2021 there is a lot of difference people have become much more aware and there are certain systems in place and the local people have played a very important role so all those happy disease they have played a very important role and uh, something uh, to be learned from uh, kerala women empowerment so uh, women empowerment is another story which has happened in um, in um, kerala and tamil nadu and many other areas now these are some of the pictures where the women are playing a very important vasant sena is a is a not not only now um, uh, an example being cited nationally but also example being cited regionally and globally that how the women can take up a role for protection of the forest <laughs> similarly the you know large involvement of women in north east there is a very heavy involved very you know high involvement of the uh, the uh, female population of that area and these are through different institutional arrangements self help groups and variety of other groups so women empowerment is another lesson which has come <laughs> ultimately protection so the protection today is not only the forest department and staff but also it's a protection where the there is a second string of the communities there are good examples from kerala there are good examples from tamil nadu there are also good examples from kaziranga kaziranga also now the locals they have been involved in protection and they have the ecodevelopment committee similar to what we have in kerala 
and they are we are trying to investigate how they are doing there must be some difference as far as kerala and kaziranga is concerned but kaziranga is another very important uh, area where such uh, things are and this is this is a typical social engineering it's not that, that you told the people that come and protect it happened it's a total social engineering among with the communities which has led to this i'll just cite you one example that how the the minds of the people they will work in one of the training program i had just joined as new field director and a training program was going on in kotya and i asked uh, in the training after the training program i was sat for some time and i asked the community what did you like in this training program and after a lot of thinking one of the adc member he says sir we liked one uh, lecture from one retired vice chancellor so i told what was the lecture he said the lecture was peace and development so i was surprised and shocked how does peace and development is associated with eco development so i told how does it lead with conservation tiger peria peace and development and he said a very important thing which i carry even today he said one of the important learning which came from this session was that most of the time we keep fighting either with the forest department or among ourselves and unless there is peace you cannot develop so if you really want to develop then you must have ensure that peace is there so this was a very simple statement but very important statement and i often give this example and this came from the same you know edc a tribal member of the edc who understood this this training in, in this form and that makes a lot of difference sustainability of these programs is very very important and we are really struggling for the sustainability different models being tried and uh, i must cite now uh, look at uh, what we have in uh, you know peria because peria has implication for the larger uh, you know institutional arrangement in the country that uh, previously peria was being managed by you know same the deputy director the field director the range officer and the staff and we were doing everything so we are doing protection we are doing research we are doing you know nature education we are doing communities everything we do but constitution establishment of foundation which now we call as the peria tiger conservation foundation previously it was the peria foundation it has really brought about a division of labor now there are now broad areas which are very clear research monitoring research coordination that's a one area protection another area habitat management another area outreach program another area eco development another area tourism another area and you have them some sort of not division of responsibilities and different sections who are dealing with this the research and monitoring foundation is doing that tiger conservation foundation is directly doing protection law enforcement communities and the staff species habitat habitat management staff mostly and also the role of the edc sometime community outreach and conservation awareness foundation and few selected staff eco development jointly by the department the staff and the the, uh, the foundation tourism the tourism guides local edcs specialized edcs and the foundation so this is how you know the things have become much more complicated but at the same time there is a division of labor and ultimately all these initiatives are being supported by the ecodelum committee bottom at the bottom of the all these there are self groups there are nature clubs and these institutions which are the ecodelum committee gradually they have also developed the horizontal linkages so it is not only vertical linkages i am talking about it has also developed the horizontal linkages by other departments local panchayat ngo and this was evident even during pandemic when we asked this question we had a survey during those uh, you know pandemic pandemic times first wave and the it was revealed that there is some sort of sense of empowerment which is appearing the sum of the edcs they have not only you know uh, waited for the forest department to come at their own they had established their linkages with panchayats and other departments and they have really taken up some of the initiatives for control of the uh, you know the pandemic and uh, this is how the you know the arrangement has become much more 
much more better as compared to before. No, not shall I will say that, you know, the whole game is this livelihood. And uh, when I talk, talk about livelihood, this, this uh, tangle is very close to my heart. Livelihood, when we say then the poor people, they derive their livelihood from different type of assets. The human assets, the social assets, physical assets, financial assets, natural assets. Human assets, if they have any skills, the local tribal, they have their own skills. Social assets, people are together. They are, you know, working together as a society, they work, as a community, they work. Physical assets, if you have land, if you have any other sources with you. Financial asset, money if you have. And uh, natural asset, your forest, river, water, whatever it is. Now, what is happening in the poverty ridden areas? What is happening in those tribal, what was happening in 1990s, 95, those areas which are, you know, inhabited by these communities? Human assets does not work. When you have the supermarkets, when you have the international brands, you have the Haldirams, you have the pickles coming from the, your human assets do not work. Your skills do not work. You require different skills. Social assets. Now, it is not that same tribal who is, you know, working as a you know, social entity. Same tribal is now sitting in his uh, house and watching a TV, you know, cable TV. So it's not the same tribe. So the social assets are weakened. Human assets are weakened. Physical assets. The land which was available with the communities has been taken by hotels and variety of other people. Because tourism has engulfed all those lands. So where are the resources? Thanks that some of the lands were with the tribals and those were not the uh, registered uh, their land. So, you know, they still retain because those are basically forest land. They have retained these land. Financial assets. If there is a need of money, then where does a tribal go? Where does a poor man go? To the money lender. And you know how much interest minimum a very honest money lender is going to charge? 24% interest or enough. 24%. Even the banks, they will give you loan much easier. So in this situation, your human assets, your social assets, physical assets, financial assets, all are weak. All are weak. They are not able to provide them anything for the livelihood. Only asset left is natural asset. So if you want money, go to the forest, cut a bundle of firewood, sell it in the market. You go again, you go two people, you go entire family. So what happens in this process? There is a vicious cycle. That the people, they start depleting their own resource base natural resources. And your trick is very simple. How do you strengthen these assets? If you are able to strengthen the other assets, the pressure on the natural resources definitely will come down. This is what has been done through the participatory program. Human assets. As in today, if you look at Parambikulam and uh, Peria, tribals have now different assets. Some of the tribals, they are involved as guides. Some of them, they have their own location, some other, other skills. Of course, they continue to do the same fishing also in some area. Social capital, the institution which you know which have come up as the EDCs or sulfur groups, they have provided them a, a social bonding. So social asset has strengthened. Physical asset, the land and making use of land, you know, getting rid of the the exploitation of the money lenders and the middlemen, that has really strengthened their physical asset. Financial assets, they need not go to the money lenders. There are some, you know, common funds available in the EDC, small, small loans. The MTR, huge money available with the local communities themselves, which they circulate, they use, and then give back to the institution. So, moment you strengthen these assets, human, social, physical, financial, pressure on the natural resources has come. So, natural capital has been put up. This is what has happened. So, not a big, big thing we have done. They have only tried to, you know, build a, um, you know, a strength in the these assets, and the uh, ultimately the natural asset has been better put. Now, if you look at the major uh, outcomes of the participatory programs, many there are three levels: the management level, protection has definitely improved, and uh, the resource use, which was recklessly going on unsustainable resources that has come down. In fact, some areas it has almost, you know, 
disappear some of the commodities trust transparency and awareness has definitely so the transparency is my, I, I i'll say that uh, um, you know in certain area the transparency has improved you know, we, our studies my study showed that because of improvement in the transparency the social uh, equations between the local people and the staff that improved livelihood support and participation people started getting livelihood support and naturally their participation improved social empowerment you know we asked uh, a question to the you know our one of our edc member then what is the biggest challenge you have when you are running a sql tourism program as a guy you know what he told if i would have asked this question in 1995 or 1992 he would he would have said sir jolly lya paise lya these were the question which he would have asked me his reply was sir the biggest challenge for us is the future so i told what is the biggest challenge he said the biggest challenge is that how do we compete with other people outside in the market so that our program becomes a ionic program and other program they are not able to compete with us that is the sense and the empowerment which has happened so i mean we were amazed in fact that we thought of oh, these illiterate people how can they think like that i think they think much much higher level than even us so this is the empowerment which has happened institution level new institution arrangements decentralized decision making foundation is one example forget about the other institution foundation is one example Peer Foundation has been able to influence the entire country. You know, while a protection act has been amended, and as on today, all the 51 tiger reserves, they are supposed to have foundations. I'll talk about that. How many foundations are there, and what they are doing? At policy level, legal changes. Can you imagine an experiment being done in one area, and it can change the national act? It can lead to amendment in the national act. i think this is something which you know as uh, keralaites we should really feel proud of this that kerala has been able to do that we don't do that so we think okay it is going on periyar a usual experiment parambikam on usual experiment going on or munar something is going on but we don't understand the importance of this you are being looked as very important you know uh, agents of change in the entire country and that is what we have to really appreciate and we should feel proud of that emerging support for mainstreaming biodiversity growth this is another challenge how do we ensure that the conservation does not only get restricted in protected areas tiger reserve because you require conservation everywhere you require conservation not only in the forest area even every outside the forest area that will happen only if other development agencies they also have agenda of conservation in their program if they also feel that our one of our objective is also conservation then only it can happen this has started happening in i mean i'll say that i'm very positive it has started happening for example as on today any no new, new road being laid in sensitive areas cannot happen like that 10 years 20 years back it was very difficult to check they'll say the road is the most important thing for communication who is the forest department who is the what is this conservation today if you have to if you have to plan a road national highway authority of india they have to plan a road then they have to do mitigation they have to really understand that these areas are important when i was the chief of warden you know during 2017 18 then i remember that uh, under bharat mala project the national highway authority people they have visited three times my office and three times we have asked them to change the alignment of the road and they have changed it so now gradually the development agencies are also becoming sensitive so probably i think we need to you know influence and create such models and uh, probably more uh, you know uh, need to be done for making the other agencies also understand that conservation is not only the agenda of forest department in the community and science and technology conservation is the agenda of everybody if you have to really survive and pandemic has taught that pandemic has very well taught that 
that you cannot mishandle the the nature, you cannot mishandle the involvement. Look at now what is happening to the community participation in the entire country. See, this this was a, a you know major exercise which is being carried out every four years, which is the management effectiveness evaluation. This is a peer review exercise being carried out for all the Tiger Reserve, and this is the fourth cycle we have completed. When you look at these red bars, red bars, you read, one is livelihood support to local communities, effective public participation, stakeholder participation. So even now, these issues, they, they are not very seriously being undertaken. These are still in the lower category as compared to funding, as compared to unified control, as compared to physical infrastructure, population trends, variety of other things. So these are still in the red area. So when it comes to the community participation, I think we need to do much more and much more seriously. So uh, it's not that uh, you know, few models and few good areas can make a sense. You need to create much more models like this. And we are in search of those models. Let me tell you now, this is the last slide before I close the uh, presentation. That we have now, you know, uh, we are currently implementing a small study, very small study. We don't require huge studies to do that. And this study is basically to understand the efficacy of functioning of Tiger Conservation Foundation. Because I understand that the Tiger Conservation Foundations have a very strong institutional agenda of community participation and the community livelihoods, in addition to the science agenda and whatnot. Out of the 51 Tiger Reserve, now the recently one more Tiger Reserve has been added, added uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu. Out of 51 Tiger Reserves, 46 Tiger Reserves have Tiger So, five. One is, of course, recently declared, but four Tiger Reserves, they have not yet declared their constituent, their Tiger Conservation Foundation. And our preliminary findings, they reveal, we have been able to complete about 16 to 17, uh, out of a sample of 30 Tiger uh, TCFs, we have completed our work for about uh, 60, 17, 16, 17 foundations. And our preliminary findings, they reveal that, that uh, some of the TCFs, they are doing good. They are doing, doing uh, particularly well, and we have seen their role in the pandemic area. Wherever, I mean, these foundations were there, they had done tremendous activities for the communities and the staff during these pandemic times. You, there are a few, uh, you know, good models. PERIAR is one of them, Parambikulamana, KMTR is one of them, but there are a few more models which uh, probably we need to, you know, um, you know uh, study more. And some of these models may be from Maharashtra, we are expecting. Andhra, NSTR is another model emerging. Kajiranga is another model emerging. And let us see that if there are more such vibrant models coming up, then PERIAR, TMTR, and Paramikon will not be alone. There will be some more good models to talk about. Okay. Uh, what has happened in the pandemic is that the performance of TCF has been definitely effective. Resources have really come down because mostly these were tourism related resources. So tourism has come down. But uh, they have been, those foundations which have been able to, you know, have their corpus money, they have saved some money. They were able to tie up, tied up, you know, during these periods very well. Some of the foundations are still starving for funds, ideas, and political will. So there are a few foundations who have not started functioning the way they are required to function as per the law. And uh, regions are the funds, regions are the ideas. And for these foundation to function, we definitely need some seed monies. Wherefrom this money will come, will have to be decided by the government. But they need some money to be, you know, to start their functioning. The resilience, when you look at the, of the foundation, uh, resilience, there are some signs of financial resilience you know, in where there are corpus money available. But it has really been challenged because of the pandemic. Well, 
you cannot depend upon so one thing which is coming up is that you cannot depend upon only one source of money which is the tourism you have to have some multiple sources of money for these institutions then only you can think of some better management of these areas institutional resilience and empowerment i told you that how the edcs they themselves have you know network with the panchayat network with the community so there are some some signs of resilience as far as institution but these are very few model not a, a regular thing which is happening the so lot of things this is just a beginning so when you look at the resilience of these foundations it is not very satisfactory we need to work more on this because unless these institutions become resilient financially and socially and politically you cannot expect that they can continue to discharge their role which is expected this study will definitely help to understand the issues which are involved in the functioning of these foundations and it will also help in designing the strategies how do we can you know we can work out how do we really move forward in this direction and i feel that these uh, foundations are going to be very very important in uh, promoting the agenda of participatory governance communities and livelihoods so thank you very much i think I'll stop here. It took a long time. Yeah. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, now the floor is open for any discussion. If you have any queries, you can just uh, raise now. Participants, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. When anybody has a question, you can unmute and ask question. Okay, Sunita, please. Uh, okay, say so I'm an AT from Vainad, yeah. uh, Sultan Bateri. Uh, now I am working in Malapuram uh, and I was very happy to hear how our uh, EGC is uh, liking to protect our natural resource. See, uh, I came here to Malapuram uh, from uh, 1999 and in my childhood days, I usually, uh, with my parents, walk into the forest. And there we were, we, we usually um, uh, see the protection of forest. But mm -hmm. now, in 2021, we can hear a lot of incidents that wild animals are uh, attacking people. Sure, it is clear that we people are the reason for that. So this type of uh, protection for our wild animals is very necessary for our well-being. Thank you, sir, for having yeah. this good talk with us. No, I think you have raised a very important concern. The you know biggest challenge for the conservation now is the, uh, there are many issues, but one of the major, major challenges is the human right of conflict. And uh, everybody is concerned about it, nationally and state level. In fact, state has uh, given a task to Wildlife Institute of India to prepare a strategy for the human wildlife conflict. So there are some long-term, uh, you know, decisions, long-term strategy, and there are short-term strategy. The short-term strategy will be definitely the, you know, putting barriers. You cannot put the barrier recklessly anywhere. So you have to plan those barriers. And you have to maintain those barriers. I remember in Vainad, and interesting that she's from Vainad and uh, Malapuram. So I started my service from the Lombo. So I know that area a bit. And uh, there was a time in Vainad, we had a power fence, I tell you. There was a first power fence in Vainad. And this was very successfully running, not only for a year or two years, but for six, seven years, this power fence ran very successfully. And the reason for this was that the power fence was daily being maintained properly. Okay. Now we have, uh, as the number of power fences have increased. So one is that, you know, we need to have some more thought process where we should have power fencing, where we should not have. Second is that the maintenance of power fencing is a, is a big challenge. We thought that the communities will be able to maintain the power fencing. 
but not everywhere the things have happened so power fence wherever you know it becomes weak the elephants will come out so that is one reason of course the number of animals have also increased so this is a big challenge and a uh, lot of people are working on this probably we will have to manage this situation in a better way <clears throat> conflict will remain i i i don't say that the conflict will disappear but long term i think there are issues of landscape management now there are issues of uh, connectivities because if we break the connectivity you cannot see the animals don't see this division a and division b range a range b animals see this as a large habitat so i think we have to have a strategy for the large landscape management how do we ensure connectivity how do we ensure that the animals are able to move in the larger areas and there is also you know some experimentation we have to do is that uh, how do we you know create a sort of uh, system jointly with the forest department and the local communities so that we are better prepared in you know dealing with these situations so interface management is very important which is happening in pockets palghat bog for example certain pockets they have been able to do this but sir is a regular you no know, problem so these are some of the issues but i agree with her that this is a major problem and lot more need to be done um, you know long term as a long term strategy and as a short short term strategy So in the chat box, uh, somebody has raised a question, sir, regarding is there any certification happening from Parabikulam Tiger Reserve? Uh, I'm not very sure that uh, I I don't think, as for my knowledge, what our products they are selling, uh, I don't think they are certified by any agency. certification agencies. Okay. But I have to check it because last one year I have not been able to understand okay. what is happening. Okay. 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 But I think certification is a very important process because your your value increases, product value increases. Yeah. See, this is a parambi honey itself is a certification. You understand? People take it not because it is honey, but they take it because it is from parambi food. Yeah. So this itself is a certification. But I think if there is a extra certification about the quality, then it really adds value. Yeah, sure. so thank you sir very much uh, i think you, know, you have shared your vast experience uh, working all over the country especially with the peria tiger so then uh, in other areas of the country wwi and as we all know that uh, tiger being the amperla species its conservation is very very important and uh, uh, its uh, numbers are also were actually dwindling all these years and slightly increased over the last 10 years if you take the uh, numeration we will see that there is a slight english so our uh, conservation activities are actually taking place and it is a uh, good thing so on behalf of uh, science technology and environment council i request uh, and nv sahab i request uh, the program officer of nv center dr sindhu to propose out of tanks sindhu please good morning today we had celebrated international day international tiger day it's my pleasure to deliver out of tanks during this event First of all, I would like to thank our Executive Vice President, Professor K.P. Sudhir sir, and our Member Secretary, Dr. S. Pradeep Kumar sir, for their constant support and encouragement. On behalf of KCST and NBSUB Kerala, I would like to thank Sri Anil Kumar Bharadwaj sir for his excellent and thought-provoking speech about tigers. I would also like to thank all the participants, including the staff from KCST and NBSUB, for making the program a big success once again thank you one and all thank you very much so thank you very much and uh, i'm really delighted that i could you know talk to you people and you know share my experiences with you after a long time and yes, sir, I can... okay. sir dr renchen yeah. from wwf has uh, asked to convey his regards he has left in the end actually because he has to attend some meeting oh thank you so much thank you yeah. so much he's a good friend of ours yeah i know he told me yeah <laughs> so thank you very much okay and, sir thank uh, you very much please, thank you please thank do you. come to dehradun whenever you have sure sir sure yeah, okay thank you sir thank you, thank you very much thank you thank you. Thank you. thank you thank you so we will call off the meeting thank you sir thank you